أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين So today we will begin a series on Mullah Sadra's book Kitab al um, Of course, Mullah Sadra is an extremely important figure in the history of Islamic philosophy, but I'm not going to spend any time talking about the history of Islamic philosophy. I have done a lot of this in the past. Um, those uh, recordings are actually there on YouTube. If anyone is interested, they can go to the um, relevant video. There's an introductory video on the history of Islamic philosophy in the, um, I think it was called the Constantinople Cons Conversations, which was recorded years ago. And then in my um, first and maybe second as well, um, lecture or class on the Kitab al-Shifa of Ibn Sina, there are a lot of remarks on that. So we will simply confine ourselves to the bare facts and that is that Mullah Sadra or Sadruddin Muhammad al-Shirazi as he is known is from the Safavid period. He's part of what is known as the school of Isfahan. This is a term originated by Henry Corbin uh, but uh, popularized much more by Sayyid Hussein Nasr. Um, he died in the year 1050 of the Hijra and that should be 1640 of the um, Christian calendar. Uh, he wrote a number of important works. His largest uh, writing is known as Kitab al-Asfar, the Book of the Four Journeys, which is in nine volumes in both of the editions which are in circulation today both of the modern editions. So I'm not going to say anything further about the history behind this or his biography. Um, for whatever reason, philosophy underwent a tremendous flowering, a blossoming and efflorescence in his time. And there was a lot of interest in the subject. Again, that's a historical question. I'm really not sure what all of the reasons were, and we'll leave that to the historians. But because of that, Mullah Sadr received an excellent philosophical as well as legal education. And many of the people who were involved in the study of philosophy in those days also practiced medicine. Interestingly enough, Mullah Sadr is not one of those people, but I wouldn't be surprised if he had also studied um, that subject. So his uh, teacher is extremely significant for our purposes, and that's um, uh, Mir Damad, Mir Muhammad Bakr Damad. Um, Mir Damad, like Mullah Sadra in his early days, uh, was devoted very much to the study of, um, of Ibn Sina and certainly the teaching of Ibn Sina. And uh, Mullah Sadra is no different as his, uh, his student. He has... Um, a very important set of uh, glosses to the um, Ilahiyat of the Kitab al-Shifa of Ibn Sina. So um, naturally the main philosopher which people devoted themselves to in the Islamic world at that time was the study of Ibn Sina, especially his Kitab al-Shifa, the Ilahiyat or the metaphysics section of the Kitab al-Shifa, along with Ibn Sina's Al-Isharat with Tanbihat. Um, and really the fundamental question for Ibn uh, Sina in the Ilahiyat, of course, is the question of being and existence. And um, that was really what Mullah Sadr devoted himself to. He said lots of things about many other topics, but it all comes down to the question of being. And so the fundamental metaphysical problem is at the very heart of um, the work of Mullah Sadra. And that's why the Kitab al Mashahir is extremely, extremely important. Now, there are some uh, translations of the Kitab al Mashahir that's already available. 
and I haven't done a translation. Uh, so it's certainly worth doing because I think that uh, both of these translations could easily be improved upon. So there is the translation by um, uh, Ibrahim Kalin and Sayyid Hussein uh, Nasr, known as the Book of Metaphysical Penetrations. I find that to be a rather awkward title. And this is published by the Brigham Young University Press. And there's a much uh, earlier one called The Metaphysics of Mullah Sadra by Parviz Muravij, uh, which was published uh, jointly by the Society for the Study of Islamic Philosophy and Science in New York and the Institute for Cultural Studies in Tehran. And this is, um, there's really no way to be diplomatic about it. This is a rather bad translation. This came out in 1992, and the uh, Nasr translation with the, um, with the um, uh, annotations of Ibrahim Kalin came out in 2014. Uh, so both of these have their problems, but we'll just have to make do. So as I said, the Kitab al Mashar is a central text for these, the fundamental uh, metaphysical problem of being. Uh, and in this book, Mullah Sadra has devoted himself in more detail than in any of his other writings to establishing his fundamental uh, thesis, which is the uh, known as in Arabic as Asalatul Wujud, or the um, fundamental reality of existence or being in the external world as opposed to quiddity. So let's just jump right in. Um, both of the translations I mentioned also have the Arabic text, so we should say a word or two about that. Um, and they are, in that sense, dual language editions. They all, both of them employ the Arabic text, which was established by Henry uh, Corbin when he first brought out a critical edition of the Kitab al Mashair in uh, 1982. At least that's the date I have on this. 1982. This is obviously a reprint because this is post-revolution. I think this was this work was actually done much earlier in the 60s. At any rate, it's Kitab al Mashair, very nice uh, edition, and it has an extensive French introduction and translation. He based himself on um, Let's see, a couple of manuscript, a few manuscripts. Um, and since we are limited in time, I don't really see much point in going into those. Uh, so I would like to just jump into the text straight away. So Nasr calls it the book of metaphysical penetrations. I don't really think that that is a good translation. Does anyone have any idea what the word al-mashahir means? What is a mash'ar? You might be familiar with the term um, al-mash'ar al-haram. So the term mash'ar really, in this context, I would say, has the sense of a way station. Um, and so then I would <clears throat> translate it as the way stations of realization. Now, why am I doing that? <coughs> Excuse me. It's because the term um, mashair, plural of mashar, <coughs> derives from a root um, shin, ain, ra, from which we also get the notion of awareness. So in, um, in Arabic, you have the term shu'ur, which means awareness, and that's also used in, in um, <clears throat> other Islamic languages like Urdu, you have that term. And we also have the word for poet, which is used in all Islamic languages, 
namely Sha'ir. <clears throat> and the Sha'ir is supposed to have some sort of insight or awareness into the nature of things, which, which um, then the poet gives expression to in, in beautiful speech. So I'm going to go with the way stations of realization. And this is a, a short book, but it's a very um, concise book. Uh, Mullah Sadra is distinguished by uh, his Arabic style, which is both very clear and very beautiful. That was, according to his teacher, Mir Damad, the cause of some of the problems which he experienced. Namely, he was um, condemned and ostracized by the religious, <coughs> the fuqaha, excuse me, the so-called religious scholars of his day because of his ideas. And when he is reported to have complained about this to his teacher, Mir Damad, Mir Damad told him that you write Arabic far too clearly um, Mir Damad is known for the <laughs> obscurity of his style. So if you understand that context, then you'll understand why he was telling Mullah Sadr what he was. And indeed, if you try and read uh, the works of Mir Damad, such as the most famous, the Kitab al-Qabasat, it's not only that it's a very difficult subject on the nature of time, but he also goes out of his way to use very difficult Arabic and obscure constructions and so forth to hide what it is that he was trying to say. Now, in this context, there is an interesting point which I would like to bring up uh, in the study of philosophy. And that is that um, there is a thesis which was put forward by an important contemporary scholar. I will reveal his name in a moment regarding philosophical writing. And this person argued that philosophers often purposely obscure what they are trying to say. And he uh, argued this in a small but dense work entitled Persecution and the Art of Writing. The scholar in question is Leo Strauss, or as the Americans will say, Leo Strauss. He was a German a Jewish emigre to the United States in the 1930s. And he first taught at the New School for Social Research in New York City, spent most of his career at the University of Chicago and spent his last years in, in, um, uh, in occupying a distinguished chair at the uh, St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. Now that's a very interesting thesis, and I want to see how that applies to Mullah Sadra. So he uh, gives some examples in his book. He starts with the discussion of Al-Farabi. He moves to Jewish philosophers. He was very interested in Jewish philosophy. Uh, very much interested in Maimonides, Maimonides, the guide for the perplexed. In fact, he wrote a very large introduction to the translation from the Arabic of Maimonides' guide for the perplexed, published by the University of Chicago Press, translated by Shlomo Pines. And then he moves on to a, a discussion of another a Jewish philosopher named Yehuda Halevi, and then another Jewish philosopher named Benedict Spinoza. And he argues that, you know, all of these guys uh, purposely wrote in a way uh, to hide what their actual ideas were. <clears throat> now, is that true in Islamic philosophy? Well, I think that Leo Strauss maybe over-argued the case when speaking of Al-Farabi, and that's really the only example he gave. I'm told that Leo Strauss had some kind of reading knowledge of Arabic, uh, that's uh, probably true, but I think it's a bit too much in the case of, um, of Al-Farabi. Now, Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina certainly has a book in which he just says things rather telegraphically. That's Al-Isharat with Tanbihat. And, um, you know, he makes it clear that this book shouldn't even be shared with, uh, with people who aren't suited for the study of philosophy. So there is a certain degree 
in Islamic civilization of esotericism when it comes to certain kinds of knowledge. Esotericism, in the case of, yes, oftentimes in the case of philosophy, but certainly in the case of the teachings of Irfan, Sufism, and if you like, I don't like to use the term, but people often do, mysticism. Um, so that's certainly the case. There is an element of secrecy and uh, obfuscation and not revealing things to non-initiates and so-called outsiders, especially in the world of Sufism. Now, in the world of Shiism, Irfan and Falsafa sort of merge and blend. Um, so can this really be applied to Mullah Sadra as well? I don't really think so. And um, again, as Mir Damad pointed out, he wrote Arabic far too clearly. But it's an interesting thesis advanced by Strauss. And Strauss, as a result of this, he had a very careful method of reading. He read things very closely. Now, that was part and parcel of Islamic civilization anyway. And I think we um, uh, can at least acknowledge that he kind of tried to um, revive that kind of reading, or if not revive, certainly introduce it into the Western world. So we have to read very, very carefully. And what Mullah Sadra does in the Kitab al mashahir it's actually a very, very uh, short book. In the edition of Qurban, it's only 71 pages, actually 70 pages. Very short, very short and concise book. And Korban divides it up into paragraphs. Those paragraphs are numbered. And in that 70 pages, there are only 150 paragraphs. And most of these paragraphs are pretty short. You know, 10, 15, 20 line paragraphs, um, maybe, tw maybe even maybe 20 is the longest you, know, you would find, and, and most of the paragraphs are quite short. So in that sense, this is quite a masterpiece, because in it, Mullah Sadra has put forward his most um, detailed argumentation and defense of the thesis of asalatul wujud, or the fundamental reality of being. And again, he does this with an astonishing degree of precision and concision without in any way uh, sacrificing profundity of meaning as well as literary beauty and excellence. And that's quite an achievement. This is something which was not a, a, a attained to by, for example, Nasir al-Din Atusi, who is extremely concise. Um, in, I'm speaking of the Tajrid al-A'tiqad, his book on the epitome of uh, doctrine, important work of Shia Kalam, which I did translate into English. Um, so he doesn't achieve that. It's extremely concise. It's, it's dangerously concise, in fact. In fact, it's incomprehensible almost without the commentary of Al-Alam Al-Hilli Kashf Al-Murad, which, you know, if he didn't write that, we'd probably never understand what he was trying to say. That is not the case with Mullah Sadra in the Kitab al mashar and also in his other books. So you can just read him directly. Now, there have been commentaries written on the Kitab al mashar and I have only one here, which is the Sharh Risalat al mashar same thing, Risala Kitab, by Mullah Muhammad Ja'far Lahiji, edited by Sayyid Jalal al-Din Ashtiani. But you will find that when you start reading this book that it's actually pretty clear. Uh, um, and you don't really always need an elaborate commentary. There's nothing wrong with that. Because again, Mullah Sadra has written all of this up in 70 pages, 150 paragraphs. So he's trying to be concise and it can certainly be expanded. But the, um, I don't think it's, there's any real um, striking cases of, of incomprehensible obscurity in the book. Um, most commentators in the Islamic world often do not say much about the opening khutbah of a, of, of, of a book. Uh, I don't think that's a good practice. And so I want to begin actually where Mullah Sadra begins. So let's just do that. So he says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, 
نحمد الله ونستعين بقوته التي أقام بها ملكوت الأرض والسماء وبكلمته التي أنشأ بها نشأتي الآخرة والأولى على تهذيب القوى القابلة للاستكمال وإصلاح العقول المنفعلة عن المعاني والأحوال للاتصال بالعقل الفعال So it's very interesting uh, to look at these opening uh, paragraphs in Islamic texts because I think that um, Muslim scholars, when they wrote, they also thought very carefully about these supposedly merely pious phrases at the beginning of a book. And Mullah Sadra is also, I think, very clear here. He is um, indicating kind of in summary fashion what his book is going to be about. So if we just go with the Nasr translation, We give thanks to God or Allah and ask for his help through his power by which subsist the spiritual principles of earth and heaven. We ask his help through his word by means of which he fashioned the two abodes of existence, the other world and this world. We ask for his help to purify our, our faculties so as to have the potentiality for perfection and correction of the passive intellect, passive to the meanings and the status concerning their union with the active intellect. Now, if you look at the Arabic, he says, he refers to the power of Allah. بِقُوَّتِهِ And then later, he uses the term al quwa which is the plural of quwa. But there, quwa is referring to God's power, and here this is referring to faculties. And so it's very clear that um, he's you know, alluding to what philosophy is actually about. تهذيب القوة القابلة للاستكمال وإصلاح القوة عفوا العقول المنفعلة عن المعاني والأحوال للاتصال بالعقل الفعال. So in essence, you know, you have philosophy as both theoretical and practical wisdom, and in this uh, philosophical quest, the goal is the training of these faculties so that they ultimately may be united with the active intellect. So in other words, philosophy is not just some sort of an ivory tower pursuit. It has this as its ultimate goal. Um, and the elimination, and the uh, elimination as it were, or the expulsion of the Satans, he actually says, shayateen, plural of shaytan, of misguiding illusions and delusions by the light of barahin or proof. So this is an important kind of pointing to um, a very uh, important um, uh, fact with Mullah Sadra. And that is that unlike many of the Sufis of his time and before his time, especially in the Sunni world, but also in the Shia world, he is not of the opinion that um, spiritual realization is somehow an irrational and purely mystical, and I use that in a, in a negative sense here, um, uh, um, exercise. Mystical in the sense that reason is sort of thrown out the window and there's simply just experience and feelings and so forth. Um, and so you find a very strong anti-intellectual trend and bias in much of Sufism, both in the Shi'i and in the Sunni context. Namely, that Burhan or apodictic proof has no place. And oftentimes, Sufis, especially in a Persian-Iranian context, whether they're Sunni or Shia, resort to the language of ishq, of deep love. And they say that, you know, in the, <clears throat> in the realm of ishq, there is no room left anymore 
for a reason and so on and so forth. And at best they have poetry and whatnot. But Mullah Sadra was never of this opinion. <clears throat> he was of the opinion that spiritual realization uh, and philosophical rigor by which he means actual proof uh, and um, logical demonstration are not contradictories. They complement one another. And he was of the view that um, you must really combine these two. At the same time, he is also very much against um, a kind of antinomian or anti shari tendency among certain, um, I would say, deviated Sufis, who's, who would say that they are so immersed in God that they don't have to pray or they don't have to, you know, be bound by the rules and limitations and boundaries, really, of the Sharia. So he was for a kind of balance of the three elements which can be summarized in three words of of quran by which we, we can mean you know um uh, the actual not just the quran but the whole sort of concept of sacred texts nusus as well as burhan by which we mean not just logical demonstration or apodictic proof but the enterprise of philosophy the philosophical quest and irfan, that is to say, actual gnosis or direct realization and witnessing of the ultimate reality and truths. <clears throat> so then he goes on, He's just elaborating further on that, of how, you know, this is that... Um, <coughs> Um, yeah, the the uh, the defeat of the enemies of wisdom and certainty, um, and consigning them to, uh, you know, the fate of those who have been far removed, and those who are who are arrogant. So these mutakabbirin again, sh shaitan was. If you're familiar with the Quran, obviously he's a, he's he's accused of this kind of mm, takabbur. أَبَا وَاسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ وَنُصَلِّ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ الْمَبْعُوثِ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَنُورِهِ الْمُنْزَلِ It could be Munzal or Munazzal مَعَهُ عَلَى كَافَّةِ الْخَلْقِ أَجْمَعِينَ So you think, oh yeah, well, this is just pretty straightforward. And we, uh, you know, send prayers or benedictions upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was sent forth with the book of Allah and his light, which was sent down with him for the uh, entirety or the totality of the creation. So what is meant by the nur? What is the nur here? Well, you know, there are many uh, arguments, many, you know, there's many statements in the Quran as well that talk about how uh, Allah has sent the messenger with the kitab and his nur. So what is the nur? You know, some people might say that, well, the nur is actually Imam Ali alayhi salam, and Mullah Sadra is a Shi'i. You could probably you know, very well make that argument. Um, there are many uh, hadiths, um, especially in the Shia collections, in which uh, the Prophet وسلم, says that um, he was a, a light, or the first thing to be made was his light and the light of Ali, and that they were sent uh, together. So you could make that argument. And then Allahumma So obviously he's declaring very much his Shi'i allegiance here. And this is also important to point out in Mullah Sadra. Um, I think he's very, very clear that the teachings of the Imams are um, 
are a, a, a manifestation in a different form of the same, exact same truths which um, the correct practice of philosophy leads to. In other words, that they are voicing or expressing the very same truths and realities that the practice of philosophy ultimately leads to and aspires for. However, those imams, of course, aren't philosophers. They didn't attain to that through some course of study. And um, at the same time, uh, those profound teachings of the imams are also what the Sufis ultimately are striving for. Um, so this is a very clear element in Mullah Sadra, and he, um, by there's there's there cannot be absolutely no mistake about his 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 Shi'i allegiance, and he argues a lot of this very clearly in his commentary on the statements of the Imams, which is incomplete. Uh, his commentary on the book of uh, Shia hadiths known as Kitab Al Kafi, the sufficiency. And he focuses on the first part of that book, which is the usul or the foundational principles, but it is uh, incomplete, but it's very clear there. So in Mullah Sadra, what you have is a confluence of some very important currents. And these are, of course, the teachings of the Imams as, as, they're, as we find in the Hadiths and in their Adi'iyya and their supplications. And what hasn't really come out here in the introduction so far, but historically we know, and from reading his other books, reading his entire oeuvre, his entire production, uh, that another important influence is the illuminationist philosophy of Shihab al Suhrawardi al-Maqtul, the uh, teachings of the Andalusian um, uh, Gnostic Sufi, Muhyiddin ibn al-Arabi, the uh, theological elaboration of a lot of the ideas of Ibn Sina by Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, and then of course the ideas of Ibn Sina himself. So all of these things sort of come together in uh, Mullah Sadra. So then he begins by uh, proclaiming his humility, which what is what Muslim scholars often, often or almost always did. And of course, in the context of Arabic, you really have to go over the top but in Arabic, it's not considered to be exaggeration. In English, especially nowadays, it sounds exaggerated. You know, the lowest of the, of the creatures of God. And the most sinful. Um, so he's, he's introducing himself in these, in, with the utter, utmost humility. And he says, so this is very important. He is addressing his readership. You know, in those days, people like Mullah Sadra wrote books for a particular readership or a particular audience. And oftentimes it was written for a particular person or small group of people. You know, his disciple or his... It, the, the disciple or a group of students of a particular teacher might come and say, Ustad, we want you to write a, you know, a book on such and such topic to help us out or comment on such and such a book to help us out because we can't understand it. Or in this case, he would be addressing a specific group of readers. That's very important to keep in mind. These people didn't write books in those days to sell them. There wasn't a kind of book industry like there is now. You know, I mean, Mullah Sadr is not, you know, let's put it in a more modern, he's not Jordan Peterson, who's writing all these books, you know, and for people to buy and for him to be a celebrity and then for him to go on YouTube or Oprah or whatever, whatever the, the platforms are today. So, and by the same token, he wasn't writing in the, in the, in the style that many modern academics do, which again, usually modern academic books don't sell that much, but there's all sorts of games of prestige and so on and so forth that are involved there. He's not interested in any of this, which is not to say that there wasn't a kind of 
academic politics and rivalries and so forth among scholars at that time like there is in today's modern academy. That was definitely there. It's very important to emphasize that Mullah Sadra completely rejects and repudi repudiated that world and he's not part of that at all. So he's saying, al ikhwan salikun He's addressing the brethren who are journeying ila Allah, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, binur al-irfan, by the light of Gnosis. He's not addressing the people who are swimming deep in the sea of usul al-fiqh and, uh, you know, and law and so on and so forth. He may be in, in, addressing those as well, if they're involved in this. So in the first instance, he is only interested in addressing people who are journeying, as it were, who are wayfarers on the path to the light of God, to the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the light of irfan, of direct witnessing and realization. Istami'u bistima'i qulubikum maqalati. Listen or hearken with your hearts to what I am saying. So again, he's addressing the heart, which is very important in, in, in Tasawwuf, which is very important in Irfan. <laughs> Excuse me. So that the light of my wisdom may be, uh, Spread forth in your inner beings, and follow my word, and take from me the rights of my tariq, of my way, from the iman, the faith in Allah and in the last day, the true iman. So he goes out of his way again to proclaim that among philosophers, he is adhering completely and totally to the orthodox, so to speak, if you like, Islamic teaching, but that this iman that he speaks of is not just a laqlaqat al it's not just mouthing of the words on your tongue, but it's al iman al haqiqi, the true iman. Again, this is very important. Which and, and this Iman Haqiqi, this true faith is Hasilan. It comes about to the so souls who 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 know or who understand Bil Barahin al Yaqiniya. Lil Anfusil Allama Bil Barahin al Yaqiniya. So again, there is this role of Burhan, of certain or of arguments or demonstrations that bestow certainty to those souls that are awakened, as it were, to knowledge. As well as the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he alluded to, when he said, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ كُلٌّ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ So this is a very sort of orthodox sort of statement from the Qur'an. You know, the believers are those, are all of those who believe in Allah and His angels and His books and His messengers. So this is important because he's quoting this proof text, but he's, he's essentially saying that he's not talking about mere kalam theology. In other words, the truths that he is going to expound, expound or expound upon in this treatise, he has seen them. He has seen them, and they are in accordance with this statement. And then there's the next statement. وَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَقَدَ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا بَعِيدًا And he says that this... This wisdom of the knowledge of Allah or belief in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers and in the last day, you know, the, the typical stuff, the typical, sorry, not stuff, but list of, of or enumerations of, <clears throat> of what is generally called Iman, and you'll find this to be the same between the Sunnis and the Shia, is he saying none other than it's identified, it's the same as the wisdom of 
the true philosophers in history and the true, r truly realized sages. Um, just by way of footnote here, um, uh, there was another student of Mir Damad. Uh, I'm forgetting his name now. I think it's Qutbuddin Ashkabari. I just, you know, one one lives and learns. I just found this out a few days ago. I wasn't aware of this before. That he wrote a treatise. Uh, well, he wrote a rather long work on uh, the history of philosophy, in which he uh, discusses the ancient sages of the world, the ancient Greeks, all the way up to to his time. You find this tendency again in uh, someone like Shahabuddin Suhrawardi, where they venerate the sages of ancient Greece and say that you know people like Plato were actually realized sages or masters or even prophets. And Mullah Sadr certainly has this view, as did as Suhrawardi. And so he's essentially saying that, that the wisdom that these guys taught is the same. Wahadi, the same as Islam. And this is the wisdom which is bestowed upon those who are deserving of it. And it is hidden from those who are unworthy. So there is an element of esotericism. But in the Islamic world, this kind of hidden knowledge was never kept from people who truly deserve to learn it. You know, if you passed the tests and so forth, then that was passed on to you. So this is what he is uh, saying here. وَهِيَ بِعَيْنِهَا الْعِلْمِ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ جِهَةِ ذَاتِهِ And this, in other words, هِيَ is feminine. So it's referring to hikmah. You have to be careful about these things in Arabic. Uh, because hikmah, or wisdom, is grammatically feminine. You see, he says, وَهِيَ بِعَيْنِهَا الْعِلْمُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ جِهَةِ ذَاتِهِ And this wisdom, which is conferred or bestowed upon those who are truly worthy of it, which is none other than the knowledge of the Book of Allah and his angel, the knowledge of Allah, excuse me, and his angels and his books and his messengers and the last day, it is none other than knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala min jihati dhatihi in terms of his essence. Al-mushar ilayhi biqawlihi, which has been alluded to by his saying in the Quran, أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِي بِرَبِّكَ أَنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيدٍ And does it not suffice you? And does not your, sorry, your Lord suffice you that he is a witness unto all things? أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِي بِرَبِّكَ أَنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيدٍ And it is also the knowledge وَالْعِلْمُ بِهِ مِنْ جِهَةِ الْعِلْمِ بِالْآفَاقِ وَالْأَنفُسِ so this wisdom is also that knowledge which comes by way of knowing that which is on the horizons bil afaqi wal anfus and within ones and within the souls of human beings al mushar ilayhi bi qawlihi which has been alluded to in Allah saying in the Quran sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana lahum annahu al haqq and we shall show them our signs or portents or portents yeah, on the horizons and within themselves until it becomes manifestly clear unto him, unto them that he or it is the truth, the ultimately real. So the divine sciences are none other than faith in Allah, Iman Billah, and his attributes. Now this is interesting. He says, Al-Ulumu Al-Ilahiyyah. Now if you put that in the singular, you'll get Al-Ilmu Al-Ilahi. What is Al-Ilmu Al-Ilahi in philosophical Arabic? What is the divine science? Well, it's Al-Falsafatul Ula. It's first philosophy. It is Metaphysics. So he keeps bringing home this point and he says, and the knowledges or the sciences 
of the horizons and the souls are from the signs, the ayat of the knowledge of Allah and his malakut, that is to say his dominion and his books and his messengers. Now, those of you, I mean, you guys are, who are listening here, many of you are well-versed in Arabic. If you see this, it says malakut here. Does that fit with, with everything else? Because he says, Al-ilm min ayati al-ilmi billahi wa malakuti wa kutubi. Doesn't it sound better if it's wa malaikati wa kutubi? So if you look in the critical apparatus, you will find that in some manuscripts it says malaika instead of malakut. Malaika being plural of angel and malakut being dominion. Whatever the case may be. Proceeding further, he says, وَشَوَاهَدُ الْعِلْمِ بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَحْوَالِهِ وَالْقَبْرُ وَالْبَعَثُ وَالسُّؤَالُ وَالْكِتَابُ وَالْحِسَابُ وَالصَّرَاطُ وَالْبُقُوفُ بَنِي يَدَيْ اللَّهِ وَالْجَنَّةِ وَالنَّارِ In other words, he's just setting out the whole list that these sciences of the horizons and the souls are from the uh, signs of the knowledge of Allah and his dominion, or if you want, his angels and his books, and his messengers, and they are the shawahid, they are um, uh, um, uh, evidences of the knowledge of the last day and what will happen there, and the grave and the resurrection. And as sual, he means the interrogation of the grave, wal kitab, wal hisab, and you know the accounting, was sirat, and the bridge which one cross, crosses in in the world to come over hell, wal bukuf bain yadayillah, and standing before God, and the garden and the fire, paradise and hell. So, in other words, all of the um, uh, um, truths of religion which are even known to the generality of believers who are not at all philosophers and who have not even set foot on this path, all of that is confirmed by, uh, by uh, this hikmah, this wisdom, this uh, philosophical uh, pursuit, as well as this mystical, if you like, his Gnostic realization. And he says that this has nothing to do. And all of this has nothing to do with the merely uh, dialectical disputations of the theologians, nor the naive uh, imitation of the generality of believers. So, this is the real thing. It's not mere profession by, uh, by, by convention or imitation. And this is a, indeed the condition of most people. Uh, most people, they simply believe because they're brought up in a particular society and they follow the conventions of that society. Um, or if you talk about the theologians, he's essentially saying that pure just empty just argumentation and and conceptual elaboration is not enough you have to have um experienced these realities and then be able to prove also and argue on the basis of actual apodictic proof and so he's saying and nor is it from what i actually just said the merely um um conceptually the mere con, uh, conceptual arguments of of condemned philosophy <clears throat> so that kind of philosophy just as he condemns mere dialectical theology just as he condemns mere imitation uh, he's also condemning the kind of philosophy that is just based on argumentation and really gets nowhere in the sense that they haven't truly realized what they are talking about so he's distinguishing what he is teaching. His, in other words, he's saying that he, the wisdom which he has brought is something completely, uh, completely different. So he's very conscious that he is presenting a kind of profound, um, um, I would say, synthesis of everything that has gone before. And then he goes further. He says, وَلَا مِنَ التَّخَيُّلَاتَ الصُّوفِيَّةِ 
So again, he's he's condemning uh, the kind of Sufism which I spoke of uh, at the beginning, uh, which is um, oftentimes against any kind of um, rational investigation, which often also went to excesses in the flaunting of the limits of the Sharia uh, and um, various other practices, which um, of, of 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 a kind of very um, public and festival-like nature and so forth, uh, certain kind of, um, you know, public performances of dhikr and so forth, uh, uh, the use of music and musical instruments in, 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 in realization, uh, sema, these are in all likelihood the things that he's kind of alluding to and condemning in that kind of Sufism. بَلْ هِيَ مِنْ نَتَائِجِ التَّدَبُّرْ فِي آيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَالتَّفَكُّرْ فِي مَلَكُوتِ سَمَاوَاتِهِ وَأَرْضِهِ مَعَ انْقِطَاعٍ شَدِيدٍ عَمَّا أَكَبَّ عَلَيْهِ طِبَاعُ أَهْلِ الْمُجَادِلَةِ وَالْجَمَاهِيرِ وَرَفْضَ تَامْ لِمَا اسْتَحْسَنَهُ قُلُوبُ الْمَشَاهِيرِ And that ends uh, the, the paragraph here. So he's saying that <clears throat> This wisdom which he is talking about, this true hikmah, this hikmat al hikmatul muta'aliya, this hikmah muta'aliya, this um, transcendent wisdom which he is talking about, is amongst the results of uh, earnest and ardent contemplation of the signs of Allah and um, deep reflection upon the uh, domain of the heavens and the earth coupled with, combined with ma'a in qita'in shadid, combined with a complete cutting off of oneself cutting off oneself from from those things which the nature of those who are involved in mere disputations and the generality of the people have involved themselves with. So there is a certain kind of, and, and he means that quite literally, it's not just figurative. It means a kind of, of, of isolating oneself from the sort of mundane concerns of not just average people, but also those kind of scholars who are just involved in a kind of uh, egotistical enterprise of acquiring more prestige and positions and 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 an outward um, recognition and acclaim by society. Um, and it is known that Mullah Sadr did indeed isolate himself for long periods in. in in his life and devoted himself to worship and study. And then of course, and a complete and total and, and utter <coughs> um, refusal and repudiation of all which the hearts of the commonality of people consider to be good. So really he's saying that if that the that the pursuit of the philosopher is very much a solitary one and the philosopher the arif the person truly committed to the realization of these truths and realities must impose a certain degree of isolation upon themselves and that that isolation is almost natural because when you feel yourself drawn to these things, you're not going to be drawn to the things that the average people are drawn to. To put it in our modern context, you're not going to be interested in the madness of these, I don't know, sporting events and, and Bollywood and cricket. And um, um, that's very much in, in India, India, Pakistan context, and you know whatever it is that people in America are, are, are obsessed with, you know the Super Bowl, or um, the pursuit of of um, the so-called American dream, the acquiring of more and more material possessions, getting a new car, new curtains, a new I don't know what, this, that, and the other thing. In other words, to put it down into one one, in, to put it into one single word, a dunyawiya worldliness. <clears throat> so the philosopher 
is a kind of solitary figure. And if he finds any kind of uh, companions who are of like mind, then these are the kind of people that he or she could associate with, people who are also involved in that quest. And that's who he is addressing this book to. He says, أَيُّهَا الْإِخْوَانُ السَّالِكُونَ Oh, you, you know, the, the brethren who are journeying toward uh, Allah by the light of Irfan. Um, so I think that um, we are almost out of time. This is about an hour we were supposed to spend today. Um, we started, we didn't start exactly on time. So we have a few minutes. If anyone has any quick questions, I'll open it up to that. Otherwise, we are stopping. And again, I'm using the Henry Corban edition, and we covered pages two and three, or paragraphs one and uh, one to two today. So I will open it up. If you want to open your mics and you want to ask any questions, you can you can do that. Okay, are you guys even there? Or have I just, just spoken for a whole hour and nobody? I just want to make sure before we sign off. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, that's good. Okay. The question I have is, so basically he's talking about his kashf, his realization, and then he wrote this book. Yes. So, so suppose that he, he, he was studying and he has this philosophical mind and he was writing before. But I think in the preface of Asfar al-Araba, he's also mentioning this, that I'm writing this after the real realization of the fact. That's so right. Or suppose if he did not have kashf, what would be his stand then uh, as compared to philosophy? Well, I think that if he didn't have his kashf, then we, we wouldn't be sitting here and talking today because he made it very clear that um, in his early years, uh, in his studies, he adhered to a particular philosophical position, namely the position known as asalatul mahiya, or that the quiddities have true and fundamental reality in the external world. And that he was very much convinced of this position, and he was only um, uh, persuaded of its falsity through a profound insight into the nature of things, which is none other than kashf. This kind of Gnostic intellectuality, or if you prefer, a kind of mystical realization. He makes that very clear. I, I don't remember where he said that. I think he says that in, he has a very clear statement to that effect in, uh, in one of his works. I think it's in a Shawahid al rububiyyah where he makes that very clear. So if he didn't have this kash, we wouldn't have it. And I think um, a lot of people forget this. It's certainly possible now for us to sit and read the works of Mullah Sadra without having this kash. <laughs> He's been very kind, uh, kind enough to write all these things down and, and clarify things. So you can have a kind of theoretical irfan, right? Or what is called the irfan and nazari. Right. Um, but what has happened is I think that because of the um, um, voluminous writings of Mullah Sadra and then his basically establishing this new school of, of thought, which represents the high watermark of philosophical and metaphysical thinking of Islam, in Islam, that now you have this, this massive sort of theoretical structure, and you can spend your whole life studying that, and you'll only know the words. Of course, that whole realization is easier said than done, but it was done. And the great representatives of the tradition of Mullah Sadra in in recent times did have, they don't talk much about it, but they did have a profound kind of uh, practice which they were engaged in. Figures, I have in mind figures such as, of course, Allama Taba Taba'i, uh, Sayyid Jalaluddin Ashtiani, Sayyid Khomeini. Um, these people were very, very well known for not just, uh, as we would say in America today, talking the talk, but walking the walk. <laughs> so um, that's my answer to that question. Sayyid Bilal, do you have any questions? No, I don't. 
No questions. All right, so it's about almost 10 after. Should we conclude there? Yes, that was interesting. All right, so if there are no questions, then we'll just stop here.